Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our critical forests, wetlands, and streams with the belief that some land is so beautiful and rare that it should be protected for the public benefit forever. Today, almost 7,900 acres and 40 miles of trails are open for you and I to enjoy 365 days per year, thanks to their incredible vision. The urgency that drove our founders continues today as we accelerate our efforts to strategically protect and restore more fragmented forests, to expand and connect our existing preserves and to create new preserves, all the while building out infrastructure and parking lots, trails and signage, that allow access for the public while also protecting these incredible ecosystems. Nature Hour is a virtual education and lecture series with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community and regional partners. We have two additional Nature Hours this fall, Chilling and Thrilling Tales of Ghost and Adventure with Adam Zern, on October 27th, and Going Batty, Bat Ecology and Conservation with national expert Kim Winter and local expert and Franklin and Marshall College professor Dan Ardia. That is on November 10th. If you're interested in supporting the Conservancy beyond attending Nature Hour, please mark your calendars for Friday, November 19th, which is Extraordinary Give, a day of community giving and support for local nonprofits, including the Lancaster Conservancy. Please consider a donation to the Conservancy during Extraordinary Give to help us save woods and water. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support and tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Dart, Ritu Associates, Penn Stone, and Nimblest. Thank you to these companies for your commitment supporting the Lancaster Conservancy and our mission. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Williams, who is the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Lancaster Conservancy. We're fortunate to have him on our team. He is an outdoor educator, naturalist, writer, and photographer who especially enjoys exploring the often overlooked parts of our natural world. He has a BS in environmental biology from Kutztown University and an MS in ecological teaching and learning from the Leslie University Audubon Expedition Institute. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Fritz, and thanks, Kelly. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to present this to you all. And so sit back and relax, but not too much. And picture, if you will, an alternate universe, a world full of predators and prey, beauty and horror. Imagine this world lives among us, hidden from view. Join us as we enter the Underlog Zone. And it's not surprising that a lot of the creatures that Flick from uh, Bugs Life saw when he entered Bug City is the same thing that we would see when we flip over a log. In fact, that same sense of awe and wonder and astonishment that Flick shows in this, in this particular scene, uh, we can feel that same thing. It's also not surprising that some of the first things we're gonna see are some of the first things that Flick saw when he finally entered Bug City, and those are the beetles. All of these things buzzing around here, all these taxi cabs, and then if we, if we played the video, we'd actually see a bus show up. That's another kind of a beetle. Beetles are some of the most uh, successful organisms on the planet. 400,000 species have been described globally so far, and there's an estimated 12 million species of beetle on the planet. So there's a whole lot of discovery to go on. And so when we flip our log over and we enter the underlog zone, not surprising that one of the first creatures we're going to encounter is a beetle. In fact, this particular kind of beetle is called a notched mouth ground beetle, and it's a predator. And this notched mouth ground beetle, that notched mouth part is pretty important for this animal because it eats these things, snails. In fact, this is a perforate, perforate dome snail, and this is a flame disc. There's over 100 species of snail and slug in Pennsylvania, and they are extremely poorly, poorly, poorly known. In fact, there's a particular species of snail that we thought was exterminated, uh, extinct, extirpated from this region called the Web Helix Multilineata. It was rediscovered in 2019 in Helm, 
by Kerry Gibbons. Kerry is a great friend of the Conservancy. He does just amazing uh, macro photography that he donates to us. And Kerry discovered uh, a, 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 a specimen of Web Helix multilineata in, I believe it was 2019. And that put that species back on this regional map. Closely related to them, we might, might find eggs of these creatures under our log, slugs. They're a mollusk, right? They don't look like a mollusk, but they're actually basically a snail. A lot of people say without a shell, but a lot of these still have a vestigial shell. So if you see this, this, little, uh, this little smooth part right here, that's the vestigial sh shell. And again, you know, 100 species of snail and slug in Pennsylvania and very, very little known, which is a, a sad statement. They're fascinating, fascinating organisms. This is not the only predatory beetle that we're going to encounter tonight though. These things at face value don't look very predatory. They're beautiful, tiny little dainty things, only about a quarter inch long. And look at that glowing amber color. When we take a closer look and you take a look at the action end of this, this, uh, this specimen right here, you see those mandibles up front. You can see that this thing means business, but not nearly as obvious as the action end of this thing. This is a beetle larvae with fangs like this. So you see these, these red things in the front here, these mandibles. This is the juvenile form of this beauty, which is a six-spotted tiger beetle, one of our most colorful uh, uh, insects in the early spring. In fact, when, when our, our vegetation is just starting to leaf out, you'll see these metallic green dots all over the bare ground. And these are the adults of these nasty, nasty little predators. And so all of these, these ground beetles and these tiger beetles are top predators. And they eat their, listen to this, they eat their body weight in pest insects, insects that damage things that we worry about daily. Uh, and so, you know, that tiger beetle probably doesn't weigh a whole lot, but when you aggregate that with all the other beetles and ground beetles and tiger beetles that live under logs, that's a huge amount of biomass of pest insects that they're consuming. I wanna talk about the, the, that term pest insect for a minute because that's really anthropocentric, right? That's really centered on us. There are ecosystems and ecosystems are made of a whole bunch of different kinds of organisms and insects dominate those, those ecosystems because insects are just so abundant, so diverse. There's really not good ones and not bad ones. They, they just are. From our perspective though, when we look at them, the ones that eat the stuff that we worry about, our crops, for example, our pests, the ones that eat the things that eat our crops are beneficials like this tiger beetle. Um, and I'm really trying to get out of that vernacular. I'm trying to get out of uh, using you know pest insect and beneficial insect because it is so focused on us. When we look at that ecology in a whole, they all have an important role to play. Now, not every one of these predatory beetles even looks like a beetle, especially when they're in this larval form, um, like this shiny tuby thing and that beautiful amber thing. These are wire worms and those are juvenile click beetles. Again, top predators, they are nasty, nasty actors on a lot of the things that like to eat the stuff that we like to eat. Uh, so we like these things and they're pretty, right? This is an Eastern eye click beetle. Now these beetles have a pretty fascinating way of escaping predation and flipping back over onto their legs if they ever wind up on their back. And that's how they got their name. They've got this, this hinge right here where the thorax meets the abdomen. You see that dark line right there. And on the under underside, they've got this latch mechanism. And so when that spring-loaded latch system releases energy, it makes the insect launch into the air with uh, 300 times the force of gravity. They experience 100 times more acceleration than what astronauts experience. And that makes them effective at escaping predation. And in fact, if you took one of those beetles and you held it on the palm of your hand, and you had it launch. If you ever did that, I remember doing that as a kid, your palm would actually sting a little bit. It's like getting a really, really bad flick. There's a ton of energy stored up in that really fascinating animals. They love lights. And we'll talk about the importance of that here towards the end of this presentation, the, uh, the effect of porch lights. Um, this is one of the, one of the uh, groups of organisms that are pretty negatively affected by that. These wire worms are one of the most colorful, beautiful organisms that we really regularly find under dead and decaying wood. They're really, really common and abundant. Um, and you know, easily confused with another really beautiful uh, amber, orange, common and abundant organism these. So you see how the wire worms are really rounded and, and, and uh, tubular, whereas these are flat. Right? These are red flat bark beetles. And again, they do a little bit of damage to some of the plants that we worry about. They can do a little bit of damage to some tree species, but for the most part, both the adult and the juveniles uh, are top predators on what we consider to be pest insects. And, and every, almost every log that we flip over, 
we're going to find these squiggling around looking for food to eat. If you look close enough, you can even see some of the vasculature. These white lines are part of their circulatory system and part of the respiratory system through that translucent, translucent cuticle skin. And then we have another top predator. These are rove beetles. Another top predator. Rove beetles are kind of interesting because when they, uh, when they feel threatened, they act like a scorpion, right? Like this is called the devil's coach horse beetle. What a great name for this animal. Look at how it looks. It looks like a devil's coach horse beetle. And you see how it's got its tail thrown up over its head like it's got a bad stinger there, like it's a, like it's a bad scorpion? Well, it's not. It's faking. It doesn't have any kind of sting at all. But it does have some mandibles up front that can give you a bit of a nip. And it does emit a chemical called pederin, uh, which causes contact dermatitis. But if we're going to talk about using chemicals as a defense, this beetle mimics the master of chemical defense, chemical warfare, the bombardier beetle. Right? Bombardier beetles can squirt um, benzoquinone at its enemies at over 100 degrees Celsius, 200 degrees Fahrenheit of this hot irritant. So it's got these different mixing chamber glands in its, in its back end, and it mixes a combination of hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide, oxidative enzymes, and they all mix together, which causes this exothermic reaction, right? So that's where all that heat comes from, that 212 degree irritant, benzoquinone, that it then squirts in the general direction of its enemy. Or maybe it just puts it out in the atmosphere to escape. Really, really effective at escaping predation. Meanwhile, this poor thing, the mimic, right, the false bombardier beetle, and notice the difference. Really, the only difference is a black head. The false bombardier beetle's got a black head, and the true bombardier beetle's got an amber head. This one only squirts formic acid with a little bit of acetic acid mixed in with no heat. But it looks the part, and it still squirts in some defense. You know, some other insects have figured out how to use biochemistry as a way to communicate and produce light. And so this is a juvenile, a larval uh, lightning bug. And this time of year, you can actually see them on the ground as these little uh, yellow, uh, amber, like lime lights, um, which gives them another common name, uh, glowworms. And they produce that, that, that light when uh, luciferin is, is uh, acted on by luciferase, the enzyme, in the presence of oxygen, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and magnesium. And we get that beautiful glowy light that we love, right? So this picture is by uh, a Japanese photographer, Kei Nomiyama. And uh, you know we don't see that kind of a, a presentation here. Um, but we used to see a whole lot more lightning bugs than what we are now. And that's one of the insects that we're, uh, we're pretty significantly worried about. And again, this is another top predator that is commonly found on and under logs. But not all life under logs makes its, makes its living entirely by killing other things. Uh, this is an American carrion beetle. And as the name indicates, um, it makes its living for part of its life anyway, eating dead stuff. Now, this adult will eat, will prey on uh, other carrion beetles. It'll prey on um, fly larvae, you know, maggots. Um, but these, these animals will lay their eggs in small mammal carcasses and in bird carcasses. In fact, I was hiking a trail uh, not too far from here at dusk, and it was getting pretty dark, and I saw this dead mouse levitating across the trail. A little bit freaky at dark. Um, and I realized it was about 20 of these adult uh, American carrion beetles moving this mouse to somewhere else so they can go lay its eggs in, in, this, in this mouse carcass. Um, this, this group of, of beetles, the sylphidaes, um, include American burying beetles, right? So this is not an American burying beetle, it's an American carrion beetle, but they're all part of that same family. They all depend on dead things, small dead carcasses, to survive because that's how they lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in those carcasses, those, those, uh, those beetle larvae, those, um, they, they eat their way out as they grow essentially. I know, kind of gross, but think about the service that these animals are providing us. Think about what our woods would smell like um, if it wasn't for these, these uh, organisms that eat dead stuff. Um, when the passenger pigeon went extinct, that's when we started to see the downfall of some of those other uh, carrion dependent beetles. I mean, all those bird carcasses falling out of the sky, and we had millions and millions and millions of passenger pigeons went away. All that food went away. And that's when a lot of these, um, these burying beetles went in a serious decline. And so a lot of those burying beetles are listed as threatened or endangered. Now, these are not. These are still considered stable, fortunately. These big beauties are one of my favorites. Um, this is a best bug or a patent leather beetle. Um, look at the jaws on that thing. It looks like it will take your finger off if you pick it up. But these are just gentle giants. They're about two inches long and, and they're the, the coolest bug. Uh, this, again, those jaws are 
there's a reason why they have those jaws. They eat solid oak. I mean, they can tunnel through solid oak with those jaws, but they don't hurt us at all. Really beautiful. They're a social insect. And so they live in family units. You'll have the parents, you'll have siblings, and the parents and the siblings actually help raise the younger generation. So those siblings are raising and helping to raise their younger brothers and sisters. And um, they've got some of the most complicated sounds in, in communication systems in the, known in the insect world. We've recorded 17 different sounds coming from these beetles, they stridulate. So they, they rub their, their wings together, similar to what a cricket or a, a grasshopper would do in order to communicate. Now I had a colony of these living on my, on my kitchen table. I mean, they weren't on the table, they were in a bin on the table in, a, in an oak log um, for about a year. And you could hear them talking back and forth. It was the most amazing thing. And the males have this horn on their head that they use for sparring. And so when it's time for males to move out of that, that, that home colony and find other space and maybe find a mate, uh, they'll flip each other over with that horn, uh, competing for a new space or for a mate. I think they're one of the most beautiful insects that we have with this orange fur that rims this shiny black leather, patent leather is a really good name for them. Most of these, these kinds of beetles, most of these Pisala beetles, beetles are tropical in nature. This is the only species that we have living in our region. They don't harm our, our houses though, right? So even though they have the ability to tunnel through solid dead wood, they do no harm to our structures, unlike these, right? Eastern subterranean termites, they eat dead wood and our homes are often made of dead wood. And so sometimes they eat our homes. They're a eusocial insect, so they have a division of labor. Um, their generations overlap and they care for their young. They have different castes. So you've got workers, which are these with the, with the not so big head. You've got soldiers with the really big head. And you've got reproductives, which aren't shown here. Um, the, social, the, the workers are born blind, they work 24 hours a day, and they die in two years. On the other end of the spectrum is you've got the queens, which control the colony chemically through hormones. They live for 15 to 30 years. Most of the, the, the species around here will live for about 15 years. Um, termite colonies can be up to a million strong, but most of them are right around 300,000. And those termites and those best bugs, you know, those, those Pisala beetles, transform solid wood into sawdust and tunnels like this and provide a great habitat for these creatures. I feel the need for peed, two kinds of peeds, millipedes on the right and centipedes, I'm sorry, millipedes on the left. <laughs> I need to get my left from right wrong. <laughs> millipedes on the left, centipedes on the right. Now, in order to understand the difference morphologically between these two very closely related organisms, I think we need to look back into their, into their history and how they came about. So they were both granted three wishes. And for the first wish, they both said, we want more legs, and they got them. And for the second wish, they both said, we want more legs, and they got them. And on the third wish, the millipede said, I want even more legs. And the millipedes got more legs. The centipede said, I want teeth. And the, and the centipede got teeth. So here's the difference. Right, you've got this millipede, and you can see there's two legs on each side per body segment, right? So four legs total per body segment, whereas a centipede has one leg on each side or two legs per body segment. Millipedes have these really short antennae, centipedes have these really long antennae, and centipedes have poison claws. So these are modified legs that have poison glands attached to them. This is an extreme case of this, right? We don't have centipedes li that live around here that look like this, thankfully. This is a tropical species where they get to be pretty long. They can get to be, you know, six inches to a foot, something that you don't want to mess with. This is something that's from the U.S. This species is a south, uh, southwestern desert species. Again, they get to be quite a bit bigger than, than the kind that we have here, but, you know, the ones that we have here have poison claws, and they can give us a little bit of a nip and a painful sting. Um, but millipedes, um, have been on the planet for 400 million years. So they're a really old uh, um, organism on the planet and their ecological importance is immense. The health of, and survival of every deciduous forest on the planet really depends on millipedes. They're the primary me me mechanical decomposers, right? So they munch up dead wood and leaves and pulverize that stuff. Um, and they're very, very poorly known ecologically, especially relative to their ecological importance. And so this is kind of a theme that's coming out, right? Out of sight, out of mind, this life that lives under logs, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to, even though a lot of the health of the planet and certainly the forest ecosystem and, and grassland ecosystems for that matter, depend on their health. 
there's 16 different families of, uh, of uh, millipede currently identified on the planet. And this is a, a member of the Julid family. This is another member of the Julid family. So two different species of Julia, uh, Julida uh, millipedes. This is a, a coronamid. And this one is probably gonna be a little bit more um, familiar to a lot of people. So these are really um, uh, you know, hidden from view. They don't come out in daylight very often. You gotta flip logs to see them. This one is pretty showy, right? This is a, a polydesmid uh, millipede. Uh, that's the family, polydesmid. This particular millipede's common name is no common name, millipede, <laughs> seriously. It's, uh, you know, you did, a, did some research on this and the scientific name is uh, Aphaloria virginiensis. I did find two common names for this though, even though it's listed as no common name, um, the Kentucky flat millipede and the cherry millipede. Now, I don't understand the reasoning behind the Kentucky flat millipede because it certainly can, uh, occurs you know, beyond Kentucky. But the cherry millipede makes a lot of sense because if you pick one of these up and you smell it, it smells like cherries. And that's because of the cyanide that it's emitting as a defense mechanism. So when you pick one of these up, you don't want to lick your fingers before washing your hands and don't lick the millipede. That's just rude if you're the millipede, right? So don't lick millipedes and don't lick your fingers after handling a millipede before washing them. Um, but absolutely beautiful, beautiful animal. Another uh, kind of millipede that might be familiar to folks because they're just so large uh, is this one, which is a member of the Spirobolid family. This is called the American giant millipede. And we have them here. They're really abundant here, in fact. Uh, Narcius Americanus. And I think it's one of the showiest, um, uh, you know, under log organisms that we've got with those really pretty beet colored legs and the, the orangey red uh, body segments. Um, just, and, and big, you know, six inches long. Um, you see this millipede just marching along. It's pretty cool. And again, can't harm you at all. Um, doesn't have those poison, poison claws like, like these do, um, like the, the centipedes. Uh, millipedes are just really, really pretty. And I think they're really underrated for what they do for us ecologically, but even in terms of their appearance, you know, um, things that live under logs are typically, uh, you know, muted in color and, and these are, are, are often muted, but when the light hits them right, they just glisten and shine. And this is a geophilid uh, centipede, right? So you can see these, these really large antennae up front here. Uh, which sets it apart from the millipedes. That's the first big giveaway, right? So these have poison claws because they are a centipede and all centipedes have poison claws, but these aren't very big. Um, in fact, you know, getting nipped by one of these would be a pretty rare event. They really look like earthworms and they perform a really important ecological function of aerating soil, just like an earthworm. Stone centipedes, on the other hand, are a bit more robust and they just look like they could tag you if they wanted to, and they can, right? So they've got poison claws that are a little bit bigger a little bit more developed um, than those geophilids. Same thing with cryptoid centipedes, right? They've got a little bit of a bigger bite to them and you wanna handle them with a lot of care. Regardless of the kind of centipede, they are really, really fast. And anybody that's turned over a stone or turned over a log and, and seen a millipede and seen them run know how quick and how squiggly they really are. And so besides their ecological importance, centipedes have played really important roles in television and film. So for example, Dean Hardscrabble, uh, the, a character from uh, Monsters Inc. University uh, was definitely directly inspired by centipedes, the creators of Monster, Monsters Inc. University uh, in fact said so. Um, Reginald Boggs, I think, was definitely inspired by uh, uh, centipedes. The creators didn't say that, but you just look at him. He's got multiple legs. And if you remember how Reginald moves, he's so fast and sinewy and um, just reminds me very much of a centipede crossed with a, a lizard. And I really think that Speedy McFeely got some of his, his inspiration for his character by watching centipedes because they were just so fast. Now, in ecology, uh, there's this, uh, uh, let me talk about the behavior. Again, these are very poorly known animals. And so, you know, I followed this one particular individual centipede for about two weeks. Every other night, I knew where this animal lived. I would flip over their log. And I would look, and at night, that same centipede would be there hunting, and during the day, gone. And so it seems like they set up, um, you know, hunting territories, and I'm sure there's some pretty complicated interactions and behaviors that go on between millipedes and centipedes and, and all the other predatory beetles that are under that log that we don't see and we don't understand. And so there's so much to learn about these incredible animals. One of the things that we're trying to study is the idea of top-down control versus bottom-up control. So in ecology, this idea of top-down control basically says that the flow of energy through an ecosystem is dictated 
by the predators, the animals at the top that control the grazers, control the consumers, right? Um, Bottom-up control says the con- converse, right? The, 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 the flow of energy through an ecosystem is controlled by the, the organisms that do the production, plants, essentially. Now, the problem is in this particular ecosystem, we don't have plants as producers. We have things that are eating dead stuff as producers. Mostly fungi, right? So lignin and cellulose are what plant cells are made out of. And that's really, really difficult to digest. In fact, most organisms aren't able to digest lignin and cellulose on their own. A lot of those insects that we were talking about, um, like the best bugs, like termites, actually have gut flora that live symbiotically in their stomachs that actually do the, the actual digestion work of emitting enzymes and breaking down the cellulose. The, uh, the, um, the insect, the, the, the best bug and the, um, and the termite just provide the mechanical means. They just you know, grind up the wood and ingest it. Um, and fungi are pretty fascinating organisms in that you know, you've got this fruiting body and that's just a tiny fraction of the total size of that organism. So you've got this fruiting body and then you've got these, my, these mycelia that just kind of weave their way throughout the whole environment. And a lot of times that environment happens to be rotting wood. A lot of, a lot of fungi eat rotting wood. Fungi have the capability, some fungi have the capability of extracellular digestion, right? So as that, that, uh, that mycelia go out through that wood, they actually emit um, uh, enzymes outside of the cell wall directly into that rotting wood, that does the job of decomposing that wood and then they suck everything back in again. It's really fascinating. And then we've got these things. These are crazy. Still trying to figure out where do we put the, what bucket do we put these things? Are they plants? Are they fungi? Are they an animal or what? This is a slime mold and they're unicellular. But then all of a sudden something triggers all these unicellular organisms to gather together. And if you've ever seen a time lapse of, of these, these animals. It is amazing watching them just move across the landscape. And I think we've got a link to a YouTube video that'll come up in the chat here at the end of this presentation. I suggest you click on that and check it out. It's just really fabulous. And there's a lot of questions about how do they communicate? How do they know how to move? And how do they know when to come together and, and break apart? And so there was always the question of what bucket, biological bucket do we put these things in? And recently they've landed in, in uh, the kingdom protista, right? So they're, they're considered protists. Um, so these are really the, in a way, the, the primary producers of this ecosystem, even though they're decomposers, right? They're not really producing anything, but those are the primary organisms that are responsible for doing a lot of that, that breakdown of that, that dead wood and dead leaf matter that fuel organisms like this. This is one of the grazers. Uh, this is an isopod. This is really, really closely related. It's a crustacean. Right? So it's closely, very closely related to shrimp and crabs and lobsters. In fact, this is the only fully terrestrial isopod on the planet. And we've got about 20 species of these that live in our, our area. And unfortunately, a lot of those 20 species aren't native here, not necessarily considered invasive, right? So there's a big distinction between non-native and invasive. Um, but these are beautiful, beautiful animals. And, and again, really uh, intriguing. So these are huge grazers on fungi, but they also process a ton of leaf litter. So I had a colony of these living under my bed for about a year. Again, they weren't just kind of living under the bed, they were in a bin under the bed. Um, and I was amazed at how fast they would process dead leaves. I would put you know, brown dead leaves in, in their bin and it was incredibly fast how, how quickly they would turn that, that full leaf into you know, sand grain sized pulverized leaf litter, which just increases the amount of surface area and increases the fungal involvement and just helps in the whole decomposition process. This is a neat one. This is a wolf spider, and this is a yellow sack spider. Now, spiders have a couple of different strategies for, for catching prey. And one of the most common strategies that we're all familiar with is you build a web and, and you catch you know, small insects and small children if you're, if you're lucky. Um, these two species though, actively hunt prey, right? So they go out and they stalk prey and they hunt them down and they attack them, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, not necessarily totally dependent on rotting wood like a lot of the other organisms that we talked about are, but certainly use that environment as their, as their uh, ecosystem, as their, as their habitat, as their niche to hunt. There are a bunch of other organisms that live under logs that aren't necessarily obligate to that, that don't necessarily 100% depend on that, but, but really uh, benefit from that environment. And one of those is really striking. This is a female black corsair assassin bug. Uh, this is a, a, a predatory insect that is nocturnal. 
And during the day, it's pretty common that you can find these uh, holed up under a log, just waiting for uh, waiting for nightfall so they can go out and hunt. And they eat a lot of the bugs that we don't like, like um, like lanternflies. And this crazy white thing right here with the fuzzy butt right here turns into this crazy white thing with the big eye. This is a plant hopper. That's a plant hopper nymph, right? So that lives under logs for protection and it emerges and winds up being that crazy looking thing related closely to this crazy looking thing. This is a, a tree hopper, right? They're all homopterans in the homopteran family. Um, look, at the, look at this thing. I think you know, it looks like a thumb or a big nose, but when you think about it, really, I think it's mimicking a thorn, right? So if that thing, if you, if you were a, a predator of, of that would want to eat this thing for whatever reason, I don't know why you want to eat it, but maybe it tastes good, I don't know. Um, and you were looking at that, it would be pretty easy to mistake that for a thorn. So that kind of makes sense. And then we've got this beautiful, beautiful moth, one of our most, I, I think, most beautiful creatures that we have. This is a, a giant leopard moth. And they start out as this big black caterpillar. This is not a woolly bear saying we're going to get 15 feet of snow, all right? You know that you, you know that that uh, that fable, right? That the more black on the woolly bear, the worse the winter. And that might be true. I don't know. Um, but woolly bears always have a, a bit of orange on them, and they turn into tiger moths. This turns into a giant leopard moth, and these really, really commonly, really uh, like the protection of of fallen wood to pupate. So you can see that this. This, uh, this caterpillar here has got part of a pupil chamber created uh, underneath this, this, uh, this rotting log. Then we've got this beauty. This is a ghost moth caterpillar. And it just looks like it's made to live under logs, and it does, right? You're not gonna find ghost moth caterpillars very frequently uh, away from a, a rotting log. Um, you know, that, that adult moth lays its eggs, they, they hatch into these caterpillars. They spend their juvenile lives as caterpillars there, and then they hatch out or pupate into this beautiful, beautiful adult ghost moth. Um, and if you if you tuned into the last nature hour, um, you know, we learned a lot about what we can do in our in our yards to create habitat for declining pollinator insects. And you learn that a lot of the pollination, most of the pollination um, in, for our food supply happens by solitary bees that are native to North America, right? They're not the social bees, honey bees, um, which are actually non-native. Uh, and this is one of those uh, solitary bees, solitary nesters, it's a green sweat bee in the uh, holictid family, holictid, egg, uh, uh, holictid bee. And I got a chance to watch this female make a, a nest. Again, she's just creating a tube basically right into this end of this dead log. And she probably laid, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen eggs in there uh, uh, early last spring. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful animal. Just this, these incredible metallic colors that we have on some of our small native bees is just breathtaking. Um, and again, they're they're the workhorses of pollination, right? So we've got bumblebees and these helictids and um, got cuckoo wasps and a whole bunch of other kinds of wasps. We've got beetles, we've got ants, we've got all these things that are doing pollination for us that we we don't really pay attention to all the work that they're doing on our behalf. You know, one one out of every three bites of food that we eat is dependent on one of these native pollinators. And ants, right? We mentioned ants. <laughs> ants are pollinators. Who'd have thunk? Um, this particular kind of ant is called a pavement ant, uh, and you know I'm always they're beautiful. I mean, look at the look at the close up on on the head of this 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 particular this particular ant and the colors on them. You can see the hairs. Now, I felt bad because I really disturbed their nest when I flipped this log over. You can see that they're really scrambling to save their young. These are all all uh, pupae, and I put the log back pretty quickly um, when I saw how disturbed that they were. Um, and then here's a carpenter ant, right? So ants perform incredibly important ecological services. And I think in the pre-show, you saw some of the, some of the, uh, the facts that, that Kelly found about ants and that, you know, because they store or have the potential to store so much carbon in soil, all right? So carbon, uh, soil could be a, an amazing carbon sink if we treat it the right way and remove that atmospheric carbon and turn it into, into soil-based carbon, which helps us out in the long run. Um, but they also do another fun, uh, function for us. So this picture was actually taken from the Turkey Hill Trail this past May. We had a, a group of volunteers out doing trail maintenance, right? And so trails, as they get used, they become berm, right? They become pitted in and that holds water. And we got to deberm it. We got to knock that outside berm off so we can get the water to shed. And what that means sometimes is knocking off this, this leaf layer that forms over the winter time. And for a thousand feet of trail, you saw nothing but this disturbed, these disturbed little mounds. These are all out, ant mounds. So they turn soil over at a ridiculous rate to the tune of 15 tons per acre per year, 
right? So think about that, 15 tons of soil per acre per year are turned over, bioturbated by ants, critically important ecologically. And then maybe what people think of as not critically important ecologically, roaches, right? So um, we've got uh, uh, roaches. These are actually Pennsylvania wood roaches. These are native to here. These are not the roaches of Joe's apartment fame. Those are German cockroaches. They're not native to here, right? Um, these are the nymphs of, of the roaches. They've got uh, three stages, egg, nymph, and adult. The nymphal stage can last for up to two years. The adult female usually lives for just a couple of months. Um, the males might actually fly around and travel fairly large distances during the breeding season. And this is another animal that has the capability of digesting cellulose thanks to uh, a, a relationship that they have with protozoans that live in their gut to break down that cellulose and lignin. Um, they're really important decomposers and they're really, really important food sources. And they can fart ammonia. Now, how cool is that? Anything that can fart ammonia is pretty good in my book. I mean, it doesn't really compare to the bombardier beetle, but you know, still not bad. Our response to these animals is typically this. Is it still there? Oh my God, ooh, 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 squish it, kill it, kill it, kill it, squish it, squish it, kill it, right? Even though they're ecologically important. We certainly heard that a couple months ago when the periodical cicadas started to emerge, right? There was a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of buzz around these, these insects that were coming out of the soil for the first time in 17 years. And in fact, as Cyril here, was peering out of his, his hole where he lived for the last 17 years at the crazy world that we currently exist in, debating, do I really want to do this and live out in that air part or do I want to stand our ground? We were trying to figure out how to kill him. Even now, as Cyril looks finally upon the ghost of his misspent youth and remembers how great the underground scene was, we're still trying to figure out how to kill him. You go to any box store and you find aisle after aisle of this stuff this stuff that kills, proudly kills, 260 plus listed insects by contact for up to three months, both above and below ground. You take that attack, combine it with this attack, right? This was a two acre wooded site that got bulldozed. Now think about all the dead and decaying wood that was on that forest floor, all the life, all the biodiversity, all the abundance, all the ecologically important functions that that life was doing for us that got bulldozed in the, in the course of a morning, in the process of putting this house up on a, on a two acre site. You take the chemical attack we're lodging against, not just insects, right? Because a lot of the things that we talked about today aren't insects, right? The, uh, the millipedes, the snails, the isopods, the centipedes, they're all affected just as much as the insects are. Combine the chemical attack with the physical loss of habitat, and this is what we wind up with, right? The insect apocalypse. This is not something that's made up, right? It's, 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 I remember as a kid, how many insects were in the world. In graduate school in 1992, I was studying entomology at University of Delaware, but I was studying terrestrial insects to use them as tools to help us assess terrestrial ecosystem health. I never ever thought we'd be at a place talking about insect conservation, right? But studies, there's, and there's a, very, a, a bit of variability in how much insect abundance and biomass we've lost in the last 50 years. The low end, that's the low end estimate is 40% loss of insect abundance over the last 50 years. The high end estimate is 75% insect loss in the last 50 years. That affects much more than the insects, right? It affects everything that depends on insect, which is just, which is just about everything, right? Woodpeckers, uh, opossums and raccoons and uh, pileated woodpeckers will shred these dead logs apart looking for, for insect meals, right? Small mammals, especially shrews and voles, shrews especially that are insectivorous, uh, use that cover of the log to effectively hunt. And we've got slimy salamanders that not only use that log as protection for cover, but also use that for a place to hunt small insects. And we've got this beauty. Uh, this is a young male five-line skink that really prefers that log habitat, plus our really, really common American toad. All of these things are affected by this stuff, including these, right? Here we are back to our, our, um, our, our really cool looking juvenile larval uh, uh, firefly, right? Glowworm. There's 150 species of firefly in North America. 128 were recently studied by the Xerces Society and by the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. 
And we, they found that 11% of those 128 species that they evaluated um, were endangered. 2% were near threatened, 33% were stable, and more than 50%, we just don't have enough data on to figure out what's going on. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you that there's a lot fewer uh, lightning bugs than what there used to be. I mean, here at Climbers Run, where I am tonight, you know, we did a, we did a, a, a nocturnal insect program this past August, and I'm like, where are the lightning bugs? There goes the program. We got to figure something else out. Um, and it's a scary prospect because we're losing this kind of beauty, right? But it goes beyond the aesthetic. It goes beyond the, the loss of the aesthetic. It goes into core ecological function loss. You know, if we keep on this decline, we're going to lose the ability of our ecosystems to take a solid log of, of a tulip poplar log in this case and take it from this condition and turn it into this beautiful, spongy, carbon sequestering water absorbing, biodiversity promoting soil. We are gonna miss them when they're gone. There's no question. But the beauty is each one of us can do something about this. This is a conservation problem that's really de democratic in that no matter where we live, no matter what we have in terms of a place to live, no matter how much land we have, if we have an apartment with, with a patio and a flower pot on it, we can contribute to the conservation of everything that we talked about tonight and then some, and then much more in fact, right? Plant native, leave the leaves in place. One of the reasons why we're losing those, those lightning bugs is because those larvae live in those leaves over the winter time. And we take a leaf blower or even a rake and remove them from our lawn, we're removing that habitat. And we're removing that habitat from a whole bunch of other things that live in the, those leaves during the winter time. Plant native stuff, monarchs are in serious decline. They're being considered for listing as an endangered species because of milkweed. All we gotta do is plant milkweed. Lights out, something as simple as turning off outside lights has a great effect. Those best bugs, remember those big beauties? They are so prone to being drawn to a light and then they die. Same thing with the click beetles, right? Those lights that we leave on affect migrating birds. They affect migrating insects. Monarchs aren't the only migrating insect. We've got migratory dragonflies, we've got migratory skippers, we've got a whole bunch of migrants and we even know about all affected by those porch lights that we leave on for no reason. Become a pesticide-free zone, don't use pesticides. We saw the damage that that stuff does. It's not selective. So you're spraying for a tick or a flea and you wind up killing everything else. And finally, you know, the work of the conservancy is so critically important for protecting the habitat of all those organisms that we need to survive. So do whatever you can to support land protection. And you know, be the slime mold, right? Take a look at that video and watch how that slime mold just crawls across the landscape. Be that slime mold with the conservation message for your neighbors about planting native, turning out the lights, being pesticide free and supporting land protection. And when you're done looking under your log, make sure you put it back because it's somebody's home. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Keith. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I The beauty that you've just shown us tonight um, that exists under logs is astounding. And I'm going to have to go roll over some more logs and then put them back just as you <laughs> ended. <laughs> so, yeah, put them back. <laughs> and definitely put them back. I just want to remind everyone um, that you can ask questions uh, for Keith to answer now here at the end of our presentation. We'll take about 10 minutes here to do so. Um, while we still have questions to to ask a question, please use that Q&A button on your screen so we don't lose track of them in the chat. Um, and as a reminder as well, we will make a, a recording of this presentation available. We will email it to all attendees tonight um, and you will receive that in the next 48 hours. Um, so let's start with a quick question here about bioluminescence and in insects and plants. Do we have any here in PA? Yeah. So. Um... You know, lightning bugs are the number one. We've got a lot of bioluminescent, uh, you know, lightning bugs. Um, you know, some of the beetles uh, have have bioluminescence, but they're not super abundant. So, you know, lightning bugs are the, really the, the big drivers on that. Another question we've got is about um, some of the more invasive insects like Japanese beetles and some of the other insects that maybe aren't native to Pennsylvania. Are those having an impact on the native species here? Well, that's a good question. Really, I don't. I haven't seen any studies that indicate it, but you would think that they would, just based on their abundance. Um, you, know, uh, you know, let's take spotted lanternfly, for example. You know, they're just so thick, 
um, that I saw them all over milkweed this year and I was worried that they were out competing uh, monarch caterpillars for space. But then I started seeing dead adults, a dead adult um, um, uh, lanternflies. And, and then started reading that, started the, some of the uh, cardenaloids that make monarchs toxic to birds were killing the, um, the lanternfly. Um, so it's really hard to say, but you know, it's, um, they're so abundant, I would be surprised if they're not having a negative effect. Mm. That's really interesting. And, and so much more to study, as you said, there's so much that we don't understand yet, just because there isn't enough data, there isn't enough knowledge. Um, and I was so impressed by um, all of your studies that you've personally done, um, rolling over logs and observing <laughs> um, different bugs at different times of day and um, over the course of weeks. Do you have any advice for maybe some of the families and kids out there that yeah. want to uh, kind of maybe do their own study of a log in their yard or on one of our nature preserves on how to uh, to keep watch and see changes over time? Yeah, so do it with respect, right? That is somebody's home. So seriously, if you're gonna roll the log over, make sure you roll it back and roll it back gently and roll it back the way it was. Um, and just, just observe it. It doesn't matter if you know what the name of something is or what the, what the name of something isn't, um, just see what, who they are. I mean, they're just beautiful and you can always look them up online. There's so many apps available on phones now that make identification so very easy. Um, in fact, you can make a beastie pit at home. Uh, and so uh, this is something that, that I learned from, from uh, schools in England. They actually have these beastie pits on their schoolyard. And it's just basically a pile of sticks and small, small logs. Uh, and they, they go out at recess and they turn them over to see who's living there. And then they turn them back to let the things, you know, live where they want to live, live happily ever after kind of thing. I like this uh, new version of a playground. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. We had a question about the metallic insects that you took um, photos of. They were just so beautiful and they really stood out. How do they survive when they're that shiny? <laughs> oh, you know, that's a great question. I never really thought about that. Now, you know, um, so, you know, we got this hol these helicted bees, helicted A, uh, all of those are really shiny metallic greens and they tend to blend in pretty good on, on a lot of the plants that they're pollinating. So that might be a form of camouflage. You know, a lot of times when something's so apparently, a, uh, or so apparent in the environment, it's a, it's a warning that, hey, don't mess with me. Um, now in the tiger beetle's case, that might be, that might be the case with the tiger beetle because they're, they're fierce. I mean, a bird will obviously come in and pick them off, um, but just about anything else is going to keep a distance from them. Um, so yeah, uh, the good question about how are they not getting picked off by predators. Um, those those uh, tiger beetles stay really, really close to the ground uh, and they're extremely wary. I mean, each species of insect I'm learning has its own kind of characteristics and own personality for lack of a better term. And they might, in fact, there's, there's new information on on insect, you know, on sentience in insects, right? On on consciousness in insects, we look at these things as objects, but they really might be, uh, might might be subjects. Um, but they're very very weary in, weary insects, and it's really hard to, to get close uh, up on a uh, on a tiger beetle without it launching long before you get close to it. So you know, part of that is a behavioral adaptation. That's really fascinating. Going over to the log portion of your program tonight. Is there an ideal amount of down logs on a forest floor? Um, yeah. Can there be too much? Can there be too little? I think definitely too little, but can there be too many down yeah. logs? <laughs> definitely too little. And I don't think there can be too much. Obviously, if you go and you clear cut a forest and leave that as a jumble, you know, you're, you're pretty significantly shifting the ecology of that system. You also got to think about fire, right? And fire load um, and fuel load. And so it's really ecosystem dependent. I don't know if there's any kind of an ideal. I know too little is not good at all. Right, because then there's no space for these things to live in, and all that nutrition is not being recycled back into the forest. Um, and I think that's the the problem that we have, especially as as we switch to, you know, biofuel and we try to harvest more and more uh, dead wood out of our forests. Um, not that that's a negative thing necessarily; it's an, a net gain because we're not using ancient carbon and emitting more ancient carbon in the in the in, into the atmosphere. But we've got to do everything with moderation, um, and so. You know, I don't know of an ideal amount, and I don't think that's been specified at all. I think that's going to be pretty ecosystem ecosystem specific, with a lot of considerations. But too little is definitely a problem. So, if people wanted to do their own kind of jumble of logs in their backyard, let's say, um, we had a question from Kevin. He wants to know if uh, he should leave larger logs out or maybe thinner uh, limbs that decompose rather than chip them. Is there an ideal diameter? Yeah, really a mix, right? Because all these different organisms have different preferences. And so if you have a diverse habitat, you wind up with a diverse uh, uh, assemblage of organisms. And so, you know, what I've seen is you get these really big diameter logs that settle into the woods, into the into the forest floor. 
and you wind up with a completely different community under that log compared to the smaller branches that might be, you know, you can get your fingers around. Um, but by having that that mix of diameters, you wind up with a, a diverse kind of habitat for those deadwood dwelling organisms. That's fascinating. The, we have a quick question here, it looks like on potato bugs, crustaceans, not crustaceans, ah, question mark. <laughs> so potato bugs, see this is, this is one of the problems with common names. So those pill bugs, the isopods could be called potato bug. Um, if it's got that segmented body, right? And more than six legs, it's not an insect. So it's likely an isopod. Now there is a potato bug, which is a kind of a beetle. And those are going to have six legs, which puts it into insecta, into, into the class insects. Um, so the common name is kind of hard to sort out. So a potato bug could be a, an isopod, but it could also be a beetle. So there's so much to try to identify. And that's where those apps come in that you talked about. Yeah. Um, do different tree species harbor different communities of insects? You know, I, would, I would imagine that they do. But again, I haven't seen a ton of data evaluating the differences of that. Now, uh, a, a good example of that is those basalid beetles really prefer hardwood. They prefer oak over, you're not going to find it. It'd be really, really rare day you find a basalid beetle in a conifer, in a conifer log. So we know that much. But um, you know the detail of, um, we know so little about uh, like the, uh, the, the millipedes and the centipedes, uh, I don't think we can say definitively uh, that you know, one kind of log is gonna foster exactly this assemblage of species versus another log. Um, you know, some of those millipedes and centipedes are there to, for protective cover. And so you know, it's gonna be um, um, you know, uh, irregardless of the kind of, 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 uh, of wood, they're just there to, for the protection. Others that are doing more of the ingestion are definitely going to be affected by the species. We have now a question. Um, I think that relates a little bit back to what you're talking about with the millipedes um, during your presentation, um, kind of around the millipedes and the centipedes, some of them having uh, some parts that might be slightly poisonous. And again, interacting with any of these insects, can you pet a giant millipede is that oh. safe <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you know you just got to do it do it gently uh you know um it really depends on the on the kind of millip on uh, wait a, a millipede absolutely yes right millipedes don't have the poison claws yes okay, okay. so you can pet you can pick up a millip that giant that giant american millipede right that big six inch one that's like got the beet colored feet and the purple um, you can absolutely pick that up and it'll tickle your palm as all those feet walk over your hand. No worries about getting bit or anything. You, you can want to wash your hands after you handle them because even that, uh, that, um, that giant American millipede has the possibility of emitting a little bit of a chemical defense, right? Not going to make you very ill or anything like that. Um, now the polydesmid, right? The, um, the cherry uh, millipede, the really pretty orange and red and black one that smells like cherries because it emits cyanide, you can handle that and with your bare hand and, and not worry about that cyanide, but you really want to wash your hands after handling that animal, um, uh, but not going to make you ill. Now, centipedes, on the other hand, you got to be careful about because they got those poison claws. Um, and every kind, of mil every kind of centipede has the poison claw. The geophilids, which are the long, thin, stringy ones, you can just look at their body shape and know that those poison claws are not that very big and they're probably not going to deploy them on you. And even if they did, they probably can't hurt you too much. Whereas, you know, some of those stone centipedes, which are short and stout, you flip them over, you're going to see the poison claws there. You don't understand why you might not want to, might not want to play with them a whole lot. We have a couple questions here that we're looking for a little bit more information again on how they can create habitat in their own yards. You've talked about you know, the different sizes of uh, diameter uh, sticks that we can leave and limbs. You've talked about, you know, not using pesticides, planting natives. People want to hear a little bit more about leaving the leaves um, and potentially, you know, using wood chips um, or not using wood chips, piles, etc. Is there, you know, kind of anything that we could also do to create, um, you know, areas on our properties, um, in our homes that, again, you know, have all the kind of functionalities that a forest floor might. Yeah, so a variety is the key, right? So you're gonna want, you're gonna want some, some log piles, different sized logs like we talked about. You're gonna want to leave the leaves. 
um, where they lay and, and take care of them. If you have to remove those leaves, do it in the springtime instead of in the fall. Um, what I've seen some people do with leaf, the leaf disposal is because they don't want it on their grass, they, they rake it to one part of their yard. So they're not disposing of the leaves, but they're creating a leaf pile, which still um, provides habitat and they can still enjoy you know, uh, unleaf lawn. Um, leave uh, stems standing. Right, that's another important thing. A lot of the the, uh, the bees will will nest in those hollow stems of spent flowers, and so instead of in the fall when the flower heads are done, cutting all those stems off at the ground surface, you know, leave them standing and and take care of that in the later later spring. Um, bare ground is actually pretty important too. So bare ground patches, it doesn't have to be an extensive patch. It could just be a small little you know one foot by one foot little patch of of bare soil. But that's important for a couple of different kinds of, of, of uh, hymenopteran, of, of wasp and bee that would make a nest out of uh, um, uh, out of clay, basically, right? Out of mud, mud dauber specifically. But then there's also ground nesters that will will potentially dig holes in that bare soil and nest there for the winter time. So, you know, variety is the key. You know, wood chips, I don't think hurt anything, but I think, you know, going out of your way to do wood chips uh, intentionally, you're probably gonna spend your energy better on putting some logs down, uh, leaving the leaves and, um, you know, leaving the, the stems, the spent stems uncut. Uh, can one mulch or not mulch those leaves or is it better just to let them be till spring? Just let them be until spring. Because if you, if you grind them up in the mulch, then uh, all the, the, really the habitat cover is gone for those animals. We have one last question or time for one last question here. Um, thank you to everyone who's asked a question tonight. We really appreciate your engagement. Um, it relates to the emerald ash borer, those down, ash tree logs you know we're, we're yeah. seeing so many trees dying right now do they still present habitat once they're dead and laying on the floor for the emerald ash borers no those those uh those ash borers need live live wood so once the ash tree is down on the ground it's it's not going to be habitat for uh for the live uh you know um uh, insect vector anymore so leave those um down the ash trees then yeah, and, leave insects, you know, yeah. and so you know, one of the one of the treatments for emerald ash borer is to to do logging of live infected trees, and if you're going to do that, you really have to chip those trees up because you can just be spreading EAB by mm -hmm. transporting log from where you harvested it to where you're going to go to dispose of it. Um, so when I was working in Maryland, we were we were involved with a project that would was going to potentially hella log the land that I was managing um, when EAB was just starting to hit, and we were working with a local forester to figure out. You know, how are we going to hell log this and where are we going to chip it? We never had to. We never got to that point. But that was the plan to keep emerald, emerald ash borer from spreading. Um, but once that log is dead, that insect isn't going to be there anymore. It's going to mm -hmm. be a different host of insects that are going to take over. Those are some great points. And Keith, I just want to thank you again um, for all the questions you answered this evening for your incredible presentation. And I'd like to welcome our colleague, Fritz Schroeder, back just to say a few words before we leave tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Keith. Our forests are made up of wood, fungi, beetles, slugs, crustaceans, leaf litter, spiders, homopterans, moths, the list goes on. Instead of the need for speed, Keith, you clearly demonstrated you have the need for peds. I love that. Great, great saying, great play on words. We often talk about the ecosystems that the Lancaster Conservancy protects with each acre of forest. And tonight you've scratched the surface or lifted the log on the very specific creatures that make those ecosystems work. They are part of the incredible and complex food web that supports human life. By observation, insect loss seems very real to me and your knowledge and efforts to educate the public are necessary and hopefully, hopefully we're not too late. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Please join us again in two weeks on Wednesday, October 27th for our next nature hour, which is the chilling and thrilling tales of ghosts and adventure with Adam Zern. Good night and be well.